Hi guys, uh, just a quick post-fight analysis of uh, UFC 307. Uh, good event. We didn't have a lot of star power in the event, I would say. There were a couple of stars, like we had Alex Pereira, obviously. We had uh, Kayla Harrison, I would say, is a big star. Then we had Wonder Boy on the prelims. But it wasn't like a packed card in terms of like the matchmaking. We didn't have like the best matchups. I would say the best matchups we had on this card was Alex Pereira versus Khalil Laundrie. That was one of the best because you had two of the best strikers who didn't want to go for the takedown. So they were just going to bang good kickboxing backgrounds. And then you had um, um, Buckley versus Stephen Thompson. That was one of my favorite matchups. Although it was on the prelims. I don't know why they're pushing Wonderboy to the prelims. Because he's been on a losing streak probably. Uh, but that was a good striking matchup. Um, so yeah, I would start from the... But the card actually, I, I would say, lived up to the hype. Some, um, most of the fights were good. Some of the fights kind of got boring a little bit because some of the people were trying to... Let's say, uh, Bautista versus Jose Aldo. Some people actually thought that Bautista was trying to... Um, he was just trying to win. He wasn't trying to like put on a show for the fans. So... But yeah, let's start with the let's start with the first fight. So the fight in the prelims card, um, Buckley versus Stephen Thompson. So it was I thought it was going to be like a striking matchup. I thought Buckley was going to put on a show, and uh, he did actually kind of, but he implemented wrestling into this, which is amazing because when you're striking with one of the best strikers, we know Wonder Boy in terms of skills and ability, he's got one of the best kicks. He's he's one of the best knockouts. He's been in the game for a long, long time. He's forty one years old. He's quite experienced. He's seen everything. You're not going to, in terms of striking, you, there wouldn't be much that you would be bringing to the table that he hasn't seen before. So it's um, it's kind of smart on the opponent's part to bring uh, to bring more skills into the game because it's mixed martial arts at the end of the day. So you can implement wrestling to do other aspects of the game as well. And that's why I like Buckley because I, I think Buckley kind of realized that um, this, is, this was probably the aspect of the game that he was lacking a little bit. And I'm talking about like, couple of years ago when he didn't have the wrestling base so he knew that he needed to implement wrestling to actually be able to go to the level when he can actually become the champion because as a mixed martial artist as an mma fighter if you want to be the champion you have to be kind of like a complete fighter you couldn't be missing you wouldn't be you, you should not be missing any aspects of the game so you need to have like the basics of everything and i i thought it was really smart in his part to actually go for the takedowns in the first like 30 seconds or 40 seconds of the match so he shot for the takedowns that was nice uh, it was actually i'm actually impressed about the um, physical ability and athleticism of buckley he's such an amazing athlete like the way he shot for the takedown it was pretty fast and uh, he picked wonder boy up i think i don't think wonder boy was expecting it to be that good and every fight we see Bus buckley just improves in wrestling i think he lacks a bit of um he has good wrestling he has decent wrestling in terms of the takedowns but i think he lacks a bit of ground control from the top because when he every time that he took wonder boy to the ground he wasn't able to keep the control on it like if i compare him to any of the russian fighters let's say um dagestani fighters especially like islam or khabib they don't lose the control so they get on top and then they keep the control they only advance to the next position or they will do the ground and pound they will so do some sort of damage and even when they're letting the fighter get it back up it's like on the rail on the rail they're not losing the control so i think that's where buckley kind of needs to improve his um, wrestling a little bit he's uh, he doesn't use his legs a lot he does have good takedowns but in terms of athleticism even in striking i i thought what he did really good was he was he was keeping the pressure on wonder boy from round one whether it was wrestling whether it was striking he was just on him because he needed it buckley's a shorter guy is like five nine five ten as compared to wonder boy is like six one and as long he's got long reach as well long legs so he kind of needed to come in and Buckley is pretty fast. He was trying to blitz in. Wonder Boy, I would say he was doing all right, actually. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like he has lost. Like for a guy who's 41 years old, it doesn't look like he, he has lost a bit. He looks a bit slower than normally he does, but it wasn't, it wasn't like his reflexes were still there. He was able to see the punches. He's still throwing good, nice kicks. He had like a couple of nice spinning kicks. Then he's throwing like a well, overhead... Um, uh had uh what do you call it it wasn't a spinning kick yeah it was a roundhouse kick so yeah and he was connecting with some of the nice shots it just he got unlucky and the knockout man i gotta i gotta give it to buckley for the knockout because coming in in the third round wonder boy actually landed a headache head kick that would have knocked most of the people out and buckley actually took it so i think buckley can take buckley can take a shot we know that but even coming in and then he kept the pressure on coming in he got hit with a cross but he still kept the pace on 
and it did like a jumping right hook, which is something that I've not seen much in UFC. I don't remember, actually, I don't recall seeing it ever. That was amazing. Like this guy inside the cage as an athlete, he might be one of the best. He can do it all night. He can do wrestling as well. Even the way he's striking, he's got one of the best knockouts. He's on a five fight win streak. Ever since his move to Waterway, he hasn't lost a fight. So I think Buckley, I, I see a bright future for him. In Waterway especially. I think middleweight middleweight was too big for him because for his height, it's like it was harder to control the bigger guys. But I think in Waterway he can do a lot. And I like the I like the call out at the end as well. Like he called it Kamaru Usman. I think that would make perfect sense because I think for Bilal Muhammad, the next competitor should be Shafkat Rakhmanov. And for Buckley, if he faces Kamaru Usman and he beats him, then he should probably be the next in line. Or maybe you can have Sean Brady because Sean Brady is probably going to fight Ian Gary. So that would be a good matchup. So yeah, I would say this was one of my favorite matches of the card in terms of like pure athleticism versus pure skill is beautiful to watch. The next one I would go for the uh, first fight of the main card that was Kayla Harrison versus Ketlin Viara. Yeah, Kayla, Kayla looked good. Uh, she wasn't as dominant as she normally is and that's why she was. A, uh, she looked a little bit down. Even the interview that he had with uh, Megan at the end, Megan Olive, she was just saying she wanted to win in a more dominant fashion. Um... But yeah, I think she should be the next. Uh, she should be the next in line. The thing is, Kayla doesn't need. She needs to be proud of herself. She's moved from. Um, so she's moved to UFC now, and she's fighting the high level guys in the high level girls in the UFC. So the girl that she fought, Kelly Vieira, she's number two in the UFC. You're not gonna have an easy run every single time. So the competition that you're facing now is only getting better from now on. And next girl that you're gonna fight is Juliana Pena. Pena. So even if you don't dominate her, I believe Kayla can actually beat Juliana Pena. I think she's going to be the favorite to win the fight. But uh, she, she she just needs to be proud of herself. You can't, because the people that you're fighting now, they're much better than the competition that you're fight, fighting previously. So yeah, just don't feel down on yourself. Your skills are amazing. Just need to improve a little bit of, I, I think your striking has improved a lot as well. But I think she just needs to work a little bit on striking. It looks sloppy sometimes, I would say. I would say speed wise, she's good. She's good at like the judo. That's like her thing. Uh, for the takedowns, I would say maybe Kayla can implement some of the double leg and single leg takedowns into her game. I think that's what she, or maybe I haven't seen it. Maybe I haven't, because I haven't seen all of her fights. Maybe she does those too. But she's more like, a, she more, mostly goes for like the judo takedowns, uh, the top body. But yeah, um, I think she should be fighting uh, Juliana Pena next. And then uh, the next fight you had, um, Kevin Holland unlucky broke his rib. Um, I would just say unfortunate. I love Kevin Holland. I love watching him fight, and I I hope we see him back soon. But uh, I hope he recovers soon, and then we get to see him back. Uh, as for Roman Delitz, I don't know who's who's gonna fight next. Um, he's on a two five winning, winning streak now. He the like, last fight was good as well. Yeah, probably. I don't know. Probably. Yeah, maybe Imavo next again. Just rematch. But that wouldn't make sense for Imavo. Imavo might be. He might want to fight for the title. So yeah, maybe just. Yeah, uh, just find someone. And then after that, you had... Um, um, so you had Juliana Pena versus uh, Raquel Pennington. Oh, sorry, Jose Aldo versus... Uh, Jose Aldo versus Bautista first. So some of the people actually thought that um, uh, Bautista was trolling the fight because he actually... The only way for Bautista to win this fight was actually to put the pace on because he's a younger guy. He's not better than Jose Aldo anywhere except in wrestling, I would say. Wrestling, he but Bautista has good takedowns. He he's good at like taking people down, but uh, unfortunately against Jose Aldo, it just sort of doesn't work. We've seen Marab uh the Georgian wrestler, the champion right now. He tried that on Jose Aldo many times, multiple times, sixteen attempts, but he couldn't take him down. It's just something about Aldo's takedown defense. I don't think anybody has that because if your takedown defense is that's why it must means that you have done some sort of like wrestling competitions or you competed in wrestling on a high level. Jose Aldo hasn't. He was never a wrestler, but the way he defends the takedown, he, he doesn't even do any kind of offensive wrestling. He's only the defensive wrestling, but it's pretty, I think it's got to have like pretty strong legs and the way he's balanced. Yeah, he's pretty like stable on his feet. So for Batista, that was going to be the way to victory, to actually clinch with him, to push him against a cage, have high output, because in striking accuracy and in terms of skills and striking, that's not even... Is there is there's no comparison. Jose Aldo is a much better, much cleaner striker. So I think he did. He had a smart game plan. It wasn't the most. It wasn't the most fun game plan for the fans, but it was a smart game plan to push Jose Aldo against the cage. Because once you have him against the cage, 
a lot of his movement just goes out of the, out of the window. So first of all, he's not getting the space because you're clinching with it. And second of all, when you're against the cage, there's not much, even when you're defending the shots, there's only uh, there's only so much backward that you can move because your, your back is against the cage. And then, so you're taking some of the weapons out. So I think that was smart and smart to put the pressure on the older guy. Jose Allo is 38 years old. He had, he had loads of fights. He has taken a lot of damage. And um, he is a five-round fighter. That's also, I think that matters as well because Jose Aldo for seven or 10 years, I think this guy was a champion. So he was defending the title for that long and he was having five-round fights. So now when he's having like a three-round fight, I think it's harder for him to actually, I would say put the pace on or push the pace on for like the three rounds. Maybe it doesn't seem that long. Yeah. Maybe maybe he's not used to like going for three rounds. He's not... Uh, so yeah, I've seen you know, seen him when he's in a three rounds fight now. He doesn't push the pace as much as he should to actually win in a fight. It looks like he's still fighting at like a five rounds pace. So yeah, for Aldo, I would say even if he retires, I wouldn't I wouldn't be mad because he's given us so much. He's one of the best featherweight of all time. Yeah, just a legend of the sport. Um, for fans booing Bautista, I I don't really uh, to be honest, I don't really get it because uh, he did what he had to do. Okay, he didn't put on an entertaining show. But he was the one shooting the takedowns. Jose Aldo was defending all the takedowns, but Jose Aldo did not actually shot for the takedown or he did not even... When he was coming in the middle, it's not like he was throwing haymakers and just trying to knock him out. The urgency wasn't there. So I don't see why fans are getting mad at Bautista. And the next fight was Raquel Pennington versus uh, Juliana Pane. Um, good performance by both women. I'm impressed by Raquel Pennington. I thought Juliana was going to be make it a bit more one-sided. It didn't. It turned out to be very competitive. I actually thought Juliana Pena um, lost the fight because Raquel Pennington. Okay, let's do a round by round analysis. You you go look at the first round. It was a very close round. I mean, there is a potential you can give it to Juliana Pena just like the judges did. But I think Raquel Pennington, she landed the more significant strikes and she probably landed more strikes as well. Round two, round three, that's not even a debate. Juliana Pena, she got some nice takedowns and they came easy as well. But it only came when she was in... when. Raquel was trying to clinch with her. So when they were closed, when they were clo in close range, because I saw, I don't know if it's like uh, Juniana's got injuries or something, she doesn't shoot for the takedowns. So it didn't look like throughout the whole fight, like she was forcing the takedowns or she was trying to go for the takedowns. It's like when they were clinching, when they already were in contact with each other, that's the time when Juliana actually went for the takedowns. And um, yeah, uh, on ground, they were, they were just on different levels, although both of them are black belts. But uh, when Juliana was on top, there's not an answer that Raquel had for Juliana. She couldn't, uh, th there isn't much she could do. Ju Juliana was able to take her back. She was close to submitting her as well. She couldn't because she didn't have enough time. Uh, ground and pound wise, she couldn't do much damage. Uh, Raquel was good at defending in terms of ground and pound. Uh, but um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't much. Around four, uh, Pennington actually kept uh, put the put the pace on. She dropped Juliana Pena, so that was a good round. You could have, you could have given it ten eight to Pennington, but again, I think because there wasn't much accumulative damage, there was just a one knockdown, and the rest was like pretty competitive. So that's why the ref only gave it uh, a ten nine round to Pennington, and um, I don't think Juliana was expecting it to get dropped by Raquel because uh, Raquel is not known for being like a, she's not known for being like a knockout puncher. And then round five, you had, uh, again, round five, you had a close round, but I thought, okay, I thought Raquel actually won the fifth round as well because she was the one actually pressing the pace throughout the whole round. So on judges scorecard, you had round one, two, and three for um, Juliana Penny. And then you had round four and five for Raquel Pennington. So yeah. I do get it. Uh, I don't think it's a robbery. I just think Raquel Pennington won the fight. So Juniana Panna, after uh, in the post-fight interview, and they actually asked her who she wants next, and she mentioned Amanda Nunes. So she men mentioned Amanda Nunes, and she and uh, they showed Kayla Harris on the Kayla Harrison on the other screen, and Kayla was like, "Oh, like you're just running away from me." And I thought that uh, Juniana was just trolling Kayla Harrison. She did not want to mention her name. Like that was the opportunity. She could have done it. But I think in the press conference, because she they, they both had like a back and forth, and Kayla's like, who gave this guy the mic? I think she was, uh, Juliana was a bit offended. And uh, she was basically just trolling at the moment. We know Kayla Harrison's going to be next. We know Amanda is retired. She's not even coming back. And even, 
even after the post fight press conference when they were like uh, Megan Olivi actually interviewed Megan um, she interviewed um, Juliana Pena and Juliana is saying the same thing again she's like Amanda is a bigger fight so I am gonna I need to have the trio trilogy against Amanda Nunes and she believes that Amanda is not finished she would want to fight back but she did not mention Kayla Harrison <laughs> Even when asked this question, she did not mention Kayla Harrison. She just didn't want to say that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, what am I interested in? I want to see Juliana Pena versus Kayla Harrison. I think it would be a good fight. And I think stylistically, it might be a bit harder matchup for Kayla Harrison than Caitlin Vieira because Caitlin was prominently a striker. I think Juliana is going to be harder, a bit harder to take down because she's very strong in a clinch, I realized. But, um, and also, she's got a really high level Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So, even when Kayla does take her to the ground, I think Juliana Pena is going to be hard to c get control on the ground. The only thing I can say is Kayla Harrison is probably a faster and um, a faster woman. She's a better athlete, and she's probably going to be physically stronger as well. So even in striking, she can pull some threats. Uh, Julie, uh, Julie, when Juliana is fighting, she kind of lunges down when she's throwing the jab on the left side. So I think left head kicks can be very effective for Kayla Harrison. Uh, and then we go to the... Uh, but yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, let's go to the last fight. Um, Poton, Alex Pereira versus um, Khali Roundtree. What a fight that was. That lived up to the hype. That actually, that was better than what we expected. We got to see every single thing. And the stock of both people actually went up. Alex Pereira, people were already fans of Alex Pereira, but his stock has gone up even more. And even Khali Roundtree. Such an amazing guy. What a display of heart from Khalid Roundtree. I think everybody's going to love him after the fight. Even though he got busted, he was bleeding. But he earned people's respect. He dropped Alex down one time. He was very competitive during the fight. He was the most technical. I would say in UFC, in terms of striking, he was probably the best striker in um, light heavyweight division that Alex faced. Obviously, Israel Adesanya in middleweight division was probably the best striker that Alex has ever faced in UFC. So yeah, I, I was really, I really enjoyed the fight. I would say Poton is the biggest star. When he came, the whole crowd was chanting Shama. He got a biggest pop and I love it when Poton actually comes and he does that. He does that. You know, the, the, uh, everyone, then he, he does that, uh, the walkout that he does and then the stay downs. Like this guy does not even blink. He, he looks the, his opponent dead in the eye for like 10 straight minutes, does not blink at all. And his stare downs was one of my favorite stare downs. Like now when I'm watching the fights, I'm not just looking for that. I'm not just looking for the fight. I'm looking for when the announcer is announcing the fight, when the stare downs are happening, when the entrances are happening. Like Poton is completely changing the game. And for a guy who's a Brazilian who does not even speak the same language as most of the fans, to get to that sort of popularity, this is crazy. And it's, it's, it's on a different level. And... Uh, yeah, he's. I think he's made UFC. He's made UFC very popular. Fans love his style because he's. Uh, he brings violence in the sport, but he's also very technical. So let's do like a quick um, round by round breakdown of the fight. So the fight starts. We already know uh, Khalil Roundtree being the shorter guy, five. Um, what is that? Six one being the shorter guy, six one. He had to come in. He couldn't have played the outside fight. That was not going to help him. The only way to beat. Alex Pereira was to blitz in because Khalil had a speed advantage. And we saw that in the fight. I was actually shocked at how fast he was. Khalil is probably one of the fast. He's, he's the fastest guy in the light heavyweight division. From footwork to his punching speed, blitzing in very fast. I thought he was coming up a little bit short in the first round in terms of hitting Alex. Like he was throwing like two, three punch combinations. Sometimes he would throw like four punches as well. But he was just coming up a bit short because Alex is very tall. Alex, Alex is like 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and he's very good at like hopping on his feet. And when the punches come, he's, he's got good reflexes. And he pulls back very well. So he would just move a little bit back. Like I was watching and I was like, maybe up two more punches. I was rooting for Alex, but I was like, if Khalil throws like two more punches in the combination, he might be able to touch him. But again, Alex, it's it's a very dangerous game because when you're blitzing in Alex, there's any, Alex can always counter you. He's a very good counter puncher as well. So when you're coming in, if he throws like, a, he catches you with a left hook or like a straight right or something like this, that's a that's a dangerous game you're playing with Alex. So you can't be throwing a lot of punches at Alex without getting hit. So I think that was that was, um, that was was happening to Khalil. Although he did eliminate some of, the, uh, some of Alex's offenses, 
Like Alex Pereira's one of the biggest offenses is left hook. It didn't look like he was able to land the left hook in first couple of rounds. Um, and then uh, Khalid being southpaw, that, that was causing a bit of problems as well. And then his rear kick, rear leg kick. So when Alex is chopping the legs, if it's like an orthodox fighter, he's much better at chopping the legs then. Because we saw him against Izzy as well. Izzy does, he changed, he changes both stances. Alex was able to adjust to when Izzy was changing to southpaw. He was able to adjust it. He was throwing the left, uh, 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 the lead leg kick, but it's not as effective, I would say, the rear one. The rear one, Alex can throw a much more power into that, and the leg of the opponent actually gets compromised pretty quick. So with Khalil, he couldn't do that because Khalil was playing southpaw the whole time, but he was still attacking the left leg. He was attacking with his um, lead leg. And I would say this caused a lot of damage and it compromised Khalid's legs. So in the long term, yes, this was effective, but his rear leg kicks was taken from Alex. And then also the head kicks, because now Alex is fighting like a shorter guy. He's also very kind of like, when Khalid fights, he's very stocky and he's like, see, he had his hands up and he has his neck in. So it's really hard to like land a leg kick, um, head kick on him. So, and that's when he ducked one of the head kicks and he dropped Alex in the second round. Because Alex won for the head kick. And Khalid being a shorter guy and he's got like a short stance as well. Like he doesn't fight very tall. Like Alex is tall, but he also fights very tall. Khalid's short, but he also fights short. So he ducked down. The head kick went over. And I think it was like a question mark kick. And then Alex is out of position. And Khalid just landed like a right hook. That's one of his favorite punches. Like he lands like a right hook and then he lands straight. Uh, that's one of his favorite combinations as well. So he landed that, dropped Alex. And then... But... Uh, Alex didn't look hurt. It was like he got dropped, but it just looked like it was just, yeah, one punch that dropped him, maybe out of balance or something. Alex's recovery is so good, and he, he knows how to put like a poker face. It doesn't look like he's hurt. Like you could you could really drop him, but he doesn't, he doesn't like move back. He would still keep the pressure on. Like Alex will stay in the middle. So the thing about Alex is if you hurt him, he doesn't really let you see that he's hurt. He wouldn't really go back against the cage or start running away from you. He He's so good at like keeping the focus. Like his brain works even when he's tired. His brain works even when he's hurt. He, he fights kind of exactly the same. And I think I love this style of Alex. Like the, he stays composed. Composed is the right word, I would say. Like even when he's hurt, he stays very composed. And it looked like he fell down and then he's straight back up. Straight back up and he's fighting exactly the same fight that he was fighting. Just a bit more cautious that opened his eyes. And it's the same thing when he hurts you. Back, like some people get so excited when they hurt you. They're like, all right, I'm just going to get the knockout now. And then they get knocked out themselves. They get carried away. But Alex is not one of those guys. Even when he gets you hurts, he fights exactly the same way. He still stays composed and stays on you. He doesn't give you too much space. So it's not like he'll hurt you and you'll be like, okay, I'm, I'm going to take my time. No, he doesn't. He still comes at you, but he comes at like a very, very decent pace, very required pace. He wouldn't just jump at you and like try to finish you straight away. And I think that was the difference in the fight. Like Alex, because he's been in so many big fights, he's been in so many biggest competitions, uh, whether it's kickboxing, glory kickboxing championships, or whether UFC, he's seen the highest level. He's fought the highest level of guys, and he's been to five rounds, six round fights in uh, kickboxing. But I think Khalil hasn't seen that. He hasn't. He is not used to having that many rounds. And that's what Alex told. Alex said that was going to be the difference. Like Khalil was, he, he would get tired. And we saw that, like first round, Khalid is fast, super fast. Second round, Khalid, we saw, okay, Khalid is slowing down a bit. Third round, we saw he slowed down massively. And I think one of the things was leg kicks as well, the left leg, which was getting compromised. And then Alex started seeing the space and he started like getting adjusted to Khalid's style. So now he's throwing, and he made an adjustment with the jab. That was amazing. So look, when you want to recognize the great fighters and you want to recognize the great dancers, think how well they adjust to the game when your game plan is out of the window. So let's say Khalil being a southpaw that threw Alex off a little bit and Khalil is the way he was fighting. It's like, okay, you've taken the weapon off rear kick from Alex. The head kicks are not really working because Khalil, he he kind of ducks down and he fights very short. It's hard to do the rear kick. And also he's a southpaw, you're going to throw a rear kick. That gives him a lot of time. So it's, it gets you open to counter as well. It's not like probably not the smartest option. And then you can't throw the leg kick now because Khalid is out, Paul. You can't throw the real leg kick. So these are not your weapons. So what he uses is he's using this left kicks. And also he's the, the weapon of the left hook has been taken because on a, on a, on a, um, Khalid's favorite punch is right hook. So if you throw a left hook, 
on Khalil. He can he can always duck down. He can always like defend it and then come back with his own right hook. So that's a dangerous game again that you're playing. So his best weapons were taken away from him. But then he found out using his own brain, he adjusted that during the fight. You saw that in the third round, how he's like, okay, I need to figure out something else. And then during the fight, he just comes up with an adjustment of the jab. And then jab was popping Khalil. And then you see, you're going back to the basics now. Like jab, just a fundamental thing. That's the first thing you learn. And he started popping him with a jab. And then he's doing like cross combinations. And then he's ducking Khalil. And then he's putting back on the punches. That's what like, he, for round four, he just entered into like a flow state. It's like he could, Alex could just see everything. Like he was in his zone. Khalil is throwing like, okay. He threw like a right hook. Alex would just duck back, throw a cross. Just just nice work from Alex after that. Just nice work. It's like Khalil couldn't touch him. And Khalil slowed down massively. So he didn't have the same speed. So now Alex could just counter him with every single thing. And Alex was much more confident coming in. Kept on attacking. His leg was compromised. So obviously Khalil, everything that he was throwing, he didn't even have the power behind it. And then Alex caught him. And then, uh, yeah, Alex pressed him against the cage. He Before that, yeah, like, caught him with a beautiful knee, pressed him against the cage, and then we saw, like, Khalil, he was done. He was tired, and he was just beat up, blood gushing out of his mouth. Alex went for two big body hooks that took, that finished everything, and then an uppercut at the end, and that was finished. That was, that's all she wrote. And, uh, yeah, I would say Alex Pereira is the best fighter. Alex, Alex Pereira is definitely the best striker in the UFC right now. But I think they're going to be conversations. From now, they're going to be conversations on who is the who is the pound for pound best fighter in the UFC. Who is the greatest fighter of all? Alex, you might actually mix Alex. You might actually people were talking about it. I saw the conversation. You might actually mix Alex in the greatest athlete conversations of all times. Like this is how good this guy is. Honestly, you might you might have to put him there. You might have to put him. It depends on how many defenses. The only criticism that we're having right now is. He hasn't fought a great wrestler. And I think Megaman and Kalev, that's going to be the next challenge. So I think that would be amazing. I think uh, if he beats a wrestler, which I think he can, I think that would put him in the conversation. As far as heavyweight is concerned, I don't want to see him going going at heavyweight. Although I think that, that he would have some exciting matchups. Like you put him against John Jones or uh, uh, Tom Aspinall. I think those would be good matchups. But as from the fans perspective i would say yes but at the same time i was like why why taking that risk like he was a middleweight who moved to light heavyweight and it looks like light heavyweight is his um actual weight loss but moving up to heavyweight that's like a big jump and you're gonna fight the bigger guys so you're like probably walking at 230 you're gonna fight the guys who are walking at 260 265 those guys are massive like you can probably strike with those guys because you're still technically better than them but those guys might be able to take you to the ground and then they're going to feel so heavy. And are you going to be able to hurt them as much as you're able to hurt them, the light heavyweights? The answer to that question, I think you might be yes. Yeah, you might be able to hurt those guys if you land enough. But can you actually take a shot from those guys? That would also be a question because heavyweights hit very hard. So I think that would be a risk. As far as going down to 185 to fight uh, Duplessis, I don't think you should do that. I think that was a bad weight cut for him. Especially at 37 years old, you don't want to be going down. You don't want to be hard on your body. And I don't think he's going to do it because he's going to leave the door open for Sean Strickland, who he's been training with. He has a lot of respect for his friend. So let's see. Yeah, let's see what happens.